Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. On behalf of the MIT CDOIQ Virtual Symposium, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have continued to support the symposium during this very challenging year. Before we thank our partners, we'd like to ask that sometime during the symposium's breaks that you visit our partners' virtual booths. You can also visit the content hub on the MIT CDOIQ website for some great partner resources. We'd like to thank the following partners, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy and Analytics, Dowex, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, Tamer, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Boomi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pylog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global IDs, Snowflake, Starburst. And as I said, please make every effort to visit our partners, use the virtual passport, because without them and our partner support, the symposium could not be held. Thank you. Of AI started in the early 80s, uh, ended in the early 90s, again with another winter, uh, driven by uh, too much hype and very little uh, deliverables. And then everybody basically uh, were denying that they ever worked uh, on AI uh, after that winter set. Again, common sense reasoning still proved to be a problematic. Natural language understanding was still unsolved. Uh, there was a severe underestimation of the complexity of some of the grand challenge problems like machine vision. And uh, probabilistic reasoning was used now, better approach than pure logic, uh, still did not scale computationally at, at the time. And what we learned was the problem was even worse. It seemed like if you were to function intelligently in a domain, you had to have a complete understanding of the world. And that uh, is hard to achieve in general, but it's possible to achieve it in certain settings, which leads us to lesson number one for pragmatic AI and making it work in the enterprise. Reduce the problem to one where complete knowledge is possible. Now, games are an example of this. If you know the, the, the game board configuration, you know everything about the game. Uh, business and engineering tasks are often a good example of this. Uh, and there were many practical applications that achieved kind of robust solution uh, using these, these assumptions. How about big problems like the grand challenge problems, machine vision, et cetera? Um, well, we found shortcuts. We didn't actually solve the problem of how humans understand uh, images. Uh, we, we solved them in, in more creative ways. So for example, if you had to um, figure out what's in a basket, uh, machine vision problem is really hard here to figure out the items, different angles, different lighting, etc. cetera. Uh, what's the engineering solution? Well, slap a barcode on every item, and now you can see it even in the dark, uh, very accurately, very fast, uh, but it has no relation to how humans see. And, and that's a, a great example of an engineering solution that doesn't tell us much about uh, intelligence. Uh, what about the hype in, 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 around AI in the 1980s? Well, there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, solving big problems. The US was uh, afraid of something called the uh, Japan AI program, the fifth generation systems. And in reality, the predictions were uh, way off. Um, we got a lot of uh, high value jobs, all the fear about replacing jobs, in fact, uh, proved to be not as relevant. Uh, productivity, uh, in fact, increased significantly. I mean, think, think of accounting. Um, you know, accounting is completely transformed from the accounting of the past to the new accounting, where now accountants spend most of the time not kind of flipping ledgers and having addition skills, but actually thinking about uh, the meaning of the numbers and how they affect the business. Now, does that sound familiar to today's hype? Absolutely. Uh, the uh, uh, replacements that happened is today, everybody's saying we're all going to be jobless and brainless. Uh, the China 2030 AI is the new Japanese fifth generation. Uh, and, you know, we're using it as an excuse to be uh, afraid and, and, and etc. Um, I actually believe that this hype uh, is, is, is going the same way here. Uh, it's, it's going to cause us to... Uh, come to the next winter. And in fact, my prediction is that we would enter the next AI winter 
in about five years. But there's a bit of good news here. Uh, despite the two winters, uh, there is one subfield of AI that survived both of them, and that's machine learning. And machine learning is really uh, going to survive, I think, the third winter as well. Uh, it's a subset of AI concerned with machines modifying behaviors based on experience, i.e. inputs, i.e. data. Uh, the earliest example I like a lot was uh, Samuel's checkers player at IBM. Um, you know, this is Samuel uh, actually uh, with his checkers board uh, programming his computer. And, and yes, those mainframes and tapes behind him are real. That's what he used at the time with punch cards. Um, the key about Samuel Checker, Checkers Player is it learned how to play by playing with Samuel. It got to be better than Samuel himself. But more importantly, uh, and that, that's kind of one indication that Samuel didn't cheat, but more importantly, he had the insight of saying, well, what if, what if, I, uh, what if I fed it all the championship games uh, in, in the New York area? What happens? Well, the program started essentially playing at the championship level, right? So way better than Samuel could have uh, ever possibly done this. And again, if you look at the algorithm itself, it was very simple. It was basically scoring a board. It had complete knowledge of the game, i.e. the board, and it had a, a function that basically scored a board position and allowed the, the, the computer to basically search how many positions and predict the most likely one to succeed. Uh, machine learning survived both AI winters, not really because we have better algorithms, but uh, we just have more data. And this is a quote by uh, my friend Peter Norvig at Google, said it about 10 years ago. Very, very true. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a key to why machine learning uh, has succeeded. Um, there was a, a, a second generation of, of neural networks uh, that, that uh, came out recently, which is uh, known as deep learning. Uh, and again, uh, deep learning is basically taking the same neural network, making it more complicated, uh, making it um, deal with a lot of uh, differences on the input, and uh, in the end, uh, uh, basically fitting to uh, a task. Um, a lot of uh, AI, and this is my kind of generic, uh, kind of brief summary of AI fields. Here are all the AI fields that we know about uh, uh, that, that constitute the field. And if you really look at what happened, is most of these fields, people stopped kind of working on them uh, in terms of trying to uh, emulate how humans do AI. And they started basically relying on the fact that uh, uh, you can do shortcuts through machine learning. Uh, and that has been very, very useful. So this is my AI Redux uh, view of it. Again, all of this was made possible because we have more data, not because we have better algorithms. Uh, Nevertheless, many practical and useful applications. Uh, it's a serious presence and opportunity. There's interesting stuff like Erika Mathematica. There's embarrassing stuff like Microsoft Tay. I don't know if many of you have heard of Tay. Um, it, was, it was a chatbot that Microsoft put up on the internet and asked people to kind of have conversations with it. Uh, some, a few hackers very quickly, within days actually, discovered that if they talked to this chatbot in certain ways, they could make it to repeat uh, uh, dirty words, and in fact, got it to say many social, uh, uh, even racial slurs. And of course, Microsoft then uh, proceeded to shut it down and pretend it never happened. Uh, there's the promising and overhyped IBM Watson got a lot of hype, but uh, in contrast, IBM Deep Blue uh, deserves a heck of a lot of respect and solved many, many problems, including uh, the game of life recently, uh, completely solved chess at the grandmaster level, etc., and uh, Jeopardy. Um, there's also the useful stuff. Uh, you know, I don't leave, I don't navigate these days without Google Maps, honestly. Um, so it's used in search also. Machine learning relevance is, is a key component in making search technology work. Uh, there's very promising things like facial recognition. Alexa now has 140K skills and growing. Uh, but of course, don't, don't try to have deep conversations. There's the annoying stuff with ad tech that bombards you with ads. You know, once you look for something, you'll probably are doomed uh, to be targeted with ads uh, about it, uh, maybe for the rest of your life. Um, 
I, I had uh, some hand to do with that back in my days at Yahoo uh, when we tried to do it responsibly, but then I think it went out of control. Uh, lots of promising bets, autonomous driving, financial advisory systems, uh, drug discovery, scientific knowledge compilation, automation of tedious tasks, what is known as robotic process automation. A lot of that is, is, is uh, benefiting. So we said this is about data and uh, how do we get the data we need to drive this? Uh, and, and a little known fact, basically in any successful machine learning project, the most expensive part is actually gathering the right training data. So um, how do we make it easy? And how do we deal with the majority of data, which is the unstructured data? Well, this is where big data comes in, in a big way that allows us to operate on structured and unstructured data uh, and kind of enables uh, more data to be fed in uh, conveniently to these algorithms. So here's an example of how any classic data space, this is a highly structured one, say from a bank, customer ID, age, gender, address, job, et cetera, how any uh, kind of very structured database can turn into an unstructured one. Uh, if we ask about where this person works, well, we can pull all sorts of information from the professional graph on LinkedIn. Uh, we can do searches and get all sorts of documents and information about where they work, how they work, what they do. Um, what they write, et cetera. Uh, social graph uh, on kind of uh, their likes and their friends' likes and what's happening on, on the social front from the likes of Facebook. Uh, YouTube and Flickr can provide many images and videos related to this, uh, tags and metadata, blogs, publications, news, local papers, what have you. All sorts of unstructured data sets available, essentially free, essentially to be overlaid with any data set that you have. So this is how a very highly structured data set can turn into a big data set. In my opinion, every data set is a big data set. And it's the variety that, that drives are calling it big. Um, how did it all start? You may want to ask. How did we get into this whole big data thing? And when was the you know, term developed, etc.? Well, the technology was developed really because we needed to count keywords and documents, billions of documents. And we needed to do it quickly. Why? Because that's how search engines work, right? Um, everything is a bag of words and you want to count occurrences and you want to count frequencies and, and inverse frequencies and so forth. So I would ask what was the earliest big data machine? And uh, surprisingly, uh, the earliest one was pretty old. Right? This is a picture of this machine uh, that actually uses T-bill sorting machine uh, for, for punch cards. So the first punch cards were the size of T-bills, why? Uh, because of this man. His name is uh, Herman Hollereth. He worked um, uh, in, in the New York area, uh, entered, uh, he was very entrepreneurial actually, uh, entered the 1888 Census Bureau competition for fast counting because the U.S. has to do a census every 10 years. Uh, he won the, the money and he used it to form a company that he called the Tabulating Machine Company. Uh, over time, they merged with three other companies and came up with a super exciting name, Computing Tabulating Recording Company. Uh, then they went through some uh, rebranding and, and change of management, and they changed their name to uh, IBM. So Big Blue was kind of uh, out there uh, starting from that very first machine. Why did he start with the T-bills? Uh, well, it's because the uh, Treasury Department was having a fire sale on old equipment and renewing its kind of uh, sorting machines for T-bills. So he used that as, as his first uh, punch cards. Um, now, we said data is, a necess uh, is, a necess is, is necessary to enable practical AI. Uh, so you want to make sure you're capturing the data. You want to make sure you're managing it as an asset, which is very important. Data is not an asset in, in many, many uh, places. Um, so how do you do that? And we said it's really all about the data because uh, we don't have better algorithms really, right, for machine learning. We just have more data. So how do we use that data? Uh, and what are we doing with all of this data? Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to speak about a few transformations that happen. We, we talk about at Open Insights, the economy of interactions, right? The world has moved from simple atomic transactions to a world of interactions where with an interaction, you go from a highly structured transactions, what, when, where, amount, and how much, that's it, to a world where you're now collecting all sorts of data, tags describing you know, what is near you, 
uh, surrounding spectrum, temperature, ambient sounds. Uh, are you moving? Are you decelerating? Are you trying to park? What are the biometrics? How are you feeling? Uh, what's on your calendar? What's next? Uh, what are the ads around you? What are the offers around you? Uh, places of interest that are nearby? Who is near you? Who, is, who are you with? Uh, who is around you? And how are you related? All this information is now actually available with each transaction. Pretty scary stuff, including the stuff coming from the wearables on the biometrics. So we, are, we have definitely moved from a world where the transaction was simple, structured, to one where it's complex and, and unstructured. If you take this to a bank and you ask, how has this changed in banking, right? A hundred years ago, um, well, even 50, 60 years ago, the, uh, a bank kind of would know you through the people, right? Uh, the branch manager and the staff would know uh, who's a good credit risk, what's your family going through, who you are, KYC, know your customer, uh, all of that. And these things were very simple, they were very intuitive, and they were based on human knowledge. When banks tried to scale, we went to a world where we no longer saw the customer. So the front office basically lost all its intimacy um, and became uh, pretty complicated to understand what's working and what's not. And the back office became super expensive, primarily because a lot of the banks moved slowly with manual technology in the, in the back office. So things like risk finance uh, became extremely expensive. Uh, things like KYC, Know Your Customer, are you know, programs that cost hundreds of millions of dollars a year at many of the, of the big banks. So a lot of these simple problems became very expensive problems. Um, uh, this bring, brings us to lesson uh, three of uh, uh, the enterprise pragmatic AI, which is AI and machine learning are very finicky. They expect data to be in certain formats. So if you don't make uh, the data easy to get at and easy to manipulate and easy to present in the fine grain detail that these algorithms need in the format they need it, it's not going to work. So that's another uh, big lesson, which is uh, not, not just capture it and manage it, but also be able to uh, manipulate it easily. So um, an example of kind of moving from transactions to uh, figuring out intent. Let's take an example of Kelly, who has a, a bank account and makes a deposit. She deposits her checks. Uh, the bank knows about Kelly that, uh, well, uh, she deposits her money. She's in good standing. End of story, right? In reality, though, Kelly is actually saving to buy a house. Uh, Kelly has a student debt. Kelly just got married. Does the bank know all this? Well, actually, implicitly, absolutely, yes. They have all sorts of evidence that allows them to conclude all of this and understand what Kelly is trying to achieve. Yet most banks don't do that. They're unable to do that because they can't get to all the data at the right time and put it together in a meaningful way to translate it into intentions. Uh, but uh, if you understood the intentions of Kelly, then instead of doing nothing, the bank could offer something very relevant, like refinance, refinancing the student loan or offer a loan to Kelly to buy a house uh, at, at the appropriate time, uh, etc. So hopefully with this background, what I'd like to do is kind of shift gears and uh, start talking about how do we kind of move to a higher level of utilizing data, of, of understanding uh, in, intent and, and, and so forth. And with that, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk through that bank example a little bit more uh, uh, about Kelly. So let's, say, let's ask a, a question from a different angle here. Um, what does the customer think of the bank, right, typically? A typical customer of a bank probably has a very transactional view of their bank. They have branches in certain places. They have a mobile app. I use their web. I use their ATMs, maybe their point of sale. And, you know, I, I write checks perhaps, right, or make payments. Uh, if you ask similarly, what does the bank think of this customer? Well, it's an equally transactional view, right? We charge them this much for insufficient uh, funds in their account. They have a personal loan. They applied for a mortgage. They want an auto loan. Um, you know, they have a savings account, they have a credit card that they don't use too much, et cetera. Extremely transactional view. Uh, in reality, what is really happening is this customer is going through some day-to-day -day events in their lives. They're trying to commute, pay utilities, do entertainment, shopping, travel, low frequency, low value, basically events. And they're going through life moments, right? They're trying to buy a home, getting married, 
buying a car, getting a degree, having a child. All of these are actually inferable. And all of these put you in different modes, be it a day-to-day -day thing or a life moment thing. And this is where the bank would be having a much more relevant conversation if they understood this from the data they have about you. And in fact, most banks have enough information to infer most of these events at the lo low frequency and at the high frequency. Um, if you do that, you can have a completely different marketing conversation with a customer. You can have a different customer service uh, conversation. You can anticipate some of their problems and maybe even contact them before they contact you with a very expensive call to your call center or, or a visit to your branch, etc. So you can make yourself much more relevant if, if you understood that. So lesson four uh, for, for enterprise pragmatic AI, AI operations should leverage understanding of the intent. So you need to think of an intent architecture that takes low level transactions or interactions and turns them into intent. And that allows you to have meaningful conversations and kind of model the actors and, and understand the actor's intent and, and then come up with intelligent actions. Another thing I wanted to talk about, uh, which was gonna lead us into the data as a service is this whole uh, data fusion, right? This project started uh, when I was at Barclays uh, as a global chief data officer, one of the big collaborations was with the cybersecurity team uh, where we basically collected data from internal and external to the bank, all over the bank, including uh, uh, app logs, including uh, other events, reports, et cetera. So very unstructured data from many, many sources, including their applications for monitoring. And the whole idea was to help the folks in the, in the security operations center overcome the tons of false alarms they were getting from all these systems, focus their attention on 5% of the events that matter. And then when you focus their attention, bring in that data to, to help them. Uh, once we put this data together, everybody else in the bank wanted something very, very similar, right? The financial crime guys wanted this data. The fraud guys wanted this data. Cyber uh, marketing wanted this data. Risk wanted this data. So suddenly this architecture became a very important uh, kind of ability to take this data and fuse it together. And we call this data fusion uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it brings all this data and makes it available in a data lake where when you focus on the right things and now you want to investigate, it also quickly brings up the data that's relevant uh, and, and makes it available. The other thing is kind of a emerge of the, or, or a best fusion of the human decision-making uh, uh, and common sense reasoning with the best of what machines do, which is low level kind of processing and sifting through data. So, you know, it's easy to classify the good and, and the bad traffic or events. The hard ones to classify really require human judgment, but the human judgment is very expensive. So you need to use it only when you need it. And when you use it, you want to actually present all the context in the right way so that they can make a decision quickly, investigate quickly and decide what to do next, right? And this, is, this was our data fusion uh, architecture. So this brings me to lesson five about making AI work in the enterprise, which is there is no autonomous AI. There is no general AI. This is about hybrid AI, uh, or if you like it, human in the loop AI, where AI systems help humans perform much of the low level work quickly and accurately and give them the context to kind of uh, do what they do best. Uh, a few final words here. Uh, there are many companies that use data. Uh, Netflix is a great example, right? They actually attribute about a billion dollars of incremental revenue to their ability to kind of suggest the next thing for you to watch. Uh, Disney, uh, who's going through trouble these days because of the COVID closures, uh, but a few years back, they invested about a billion dollars in uh, basically creating wearables. Um, they became the fourth largest distributor of wearables in the world. Uh, that resulted in 30% less uh, lines, basically, turnstile transaction time, and uh, labor uh, resource management improved by 20%. So basically, win, 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 right? Customer is happy, Disney is happy, and uh, everything moves more efficiently. Uh, IoT, of course, brings in a whole other set of questions beyond the scope of this talk. But a whole issue when billions of devices start talking to each other, how do they recognize, who do they trust, who do they report to, who owns them basically, uh, and who do they listen to, right? Uh, the whole notion in cybersecurity of the perimeter is completely changing. There is no perimeter anymore. 
and, and, and how do you now protect in that world? So the real key here, as, you, as we digitize, and COVID has gotten us to digitize faster than any other time in history, the real question becomes is how do we make this data work for the business instead of kind of overwhelming the business? A typical, uh, uh, when, I, when I walk into a large enterprise, one of the first things I ask the business is what do you expect from data? And they say, well, we want it to be reliable, affordable, timely, accurate, comprehensive, unified, accessible, easy to understand and easy to embed in business actions. Reality though <laughs> is almost none of these are typically satisfied, right? And typically what we find is silos, lots of fragmentation, extremely expensive data systems, questionable quality, uh, incomplete, no story for unstructured data, unusable essentially, uh, despite the fact that big budgets uh, go to it. So big data comes in with a, with a promise to kind of help do this better through data leaks, et cetera, but also big data comes with big problems, which is they could, you could generate a big mess very quickly. Uh, the 90% the of the data in any organization, according to Gartner, is unstructured. 100% of databases, traditional RDBMSs, are basically structured only. So that means in this new age, we're actually ignoring most of our data assets, right? Because we're relying on older database technology. And hence, why I believe big data and, and uh, data bases that manage unstructured data are, are the future. So let me summarize now before I kind of uh, transition to conclusions and go to my uh, last two parts of the talk. One is uh, how do we make AI work in an enterprise? We mentioned five lessons, reduce the problem to one where you have complete knowledge and it's very possible in narrow circumstances. So the narrower, the better. Data is necessary enable, enabler. So you make sure the data is captured and managed as an asset, not as a liability. That's kind of waiting to be either internally leaked or externally hacked. Uh, AI and machine learning expect data in certain formats, so have a, a utility, uh, a data as a service, we call it, that helps you um, manage it correctly and then provide it to the algorithms at, at the level they need it, right? Algorithms need data at a much higher level of detail that traditional reporting systems don't provide because they work the aggregations. Uh, you should model intent and utilize intent to drive intelligence. And finally, there is no general AI and there's no autonomous AI. Think about how do you make hybrid AI, AI with human in the loop work. And these are at least my lessons for how to make this technology uh, work in, in enterprises. And I've learned this through uh, kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of battles and a lot of battle scars. So with that, I would like to um, sort of drive us into certain conclusions uh, about this part of the talk and then focus on a couple of areas on how to create a healthy uh, data ecosystem and how to make things work. So what are the takeaway lessons uh, for us from all of this? Well, AI is not about replacing the human with a robot. AI is about taking the robot out of the human. I believe this quote comes from the MIT Media Lab, but I'm not completely sure, but I love it because I think it actually says, use AI for the things AI is good for and use the humans for what humans are, are really good at and machines can't get there. And remember that we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data. So make sure you have uh, the data captured, the data managed and the data clean and the data of high quality. And make sure you have meaningful training data. Um, looking to the future uh, of AI and big data, well, no big data basically means no functional AI in my opinion. Uh, yet most enterprises do not have the know-how or the talent to create the right data environment. So most digital transformations effectively miss out on the proper plan for data, uh, rendering them not intelligent or not AI enabled. So what do we need to do to do a, a proper AI and, and, and data science ecosystem? Well, we need to think about what is needed for a healthy data and AI environment here. And what you need there is a strong, data and compute infrastructure, meaning you couple big data with the edge fog cloud strategy with your elastic compute so that these things are not an issue. Data as a service, meaning it's a utility. Uh, it frees up the data scientists from instead of spending 90% of their time chasing data and explaining problems with data, they're actually using data and utilizing their expensive time very well. And we'll talk about that bit in a second. Um, you need, uh, 
these activities, the advanced analytics, to basically leverage the data assets easily. Uh, you need an ability to share data safely within the organization and outside it. And many, many companies forget about uh, the issues they have with kind of data privacy violations inside the organization. You need, to, of course, to have the proper permissions to use and share the data. Uh, at, at, at the limit, that's the right consumer opt-in, meaningful opt-in, et cetera. And we can talk about that in a separate talk. And you need the right talent in data science to make it all work, right? The right teams who understand big data, data engineering, and data science. So that's the last part of my talk. I will focus on two areas. Let's talk a little bit about the data ecosystem, uh, and particularly sharing and privacy. Uh, message number one, data privacy is, gr is a growing concern. Uh, according to, to an analyst at, at Gartner, uh, basically privacy regulations across the globe have developed more in the past 12 months than they have in the preceding century. Uh, pretty interesting. And now we see everything from GDPR to the California Consumer Privacy to the uh, Privacy Shield to a whole bunch of uh, many, many new legislations coming up. Data privacy historically has ignored the use of data. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, if if uh, you know, you allow people to say use the average uh, of a data set, right? Well, the, uh, you know, average over a database of 30 some million of diabetes cases is clearly a, a private uh, uh, quantity to get. The average on a much smaller uh, uh, database, like 7,000 cases of Rett syndrome, which uh, uh, in the US hits basically uh, young girls uh, they're starting to ask about average age and things like that could easily lead into uh, privacy breaking and figuring out who's who, et cetera. So again, it's not about just saying, well, average is okay. It's about uh, how you use this data. Here's an example of an anonymization uh, failure. This came a courtesy of Leap Year, uh, and, and it comes originally from Aaron Roth, who's, who's a well-known kind of uh, privacy and, uh, uh, expert. Um, Basically, imagine you have two databases, right, where the name has been anonymized, you don't see it. You get age ranges, age ranges, not ages, to further anonymize, right? You have gender and, and zip code with, with kind of some obfuscation, and you have a diagnosis, right? Now, let's say you happen to know uh, outside uh, this, uh, this database uh, from, from another database that you might have access to, et cetera, that there is a woman who happened to visit or be treated at both hospitals, right? And uh, you can effectively, uh, this is a situation where you could easily, for example, infer the identity of that person and kind of what they were treated to and what kind of two conditions uh, did they have, right? So in this case, for example, it's, 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 it's this person with HIV that happens to be Kind of treated at both hospitals and by triangulation you can very quickly home in on that candidate right uh, and that's that's why it's so easy to defeat privacy and this is why even what looks like anonymized data sets is not anonymous typically um, um, leap year actually it's a company I, I i work with i'm on their advisory board and they use uh, differential uh, privacy uh, the whole notion here is to basically say look do, do micro data privacy. So what is the question? What is the data you need? And who is accessing it? And that's where you decide live, kind of based on some mathematics, what can they see and what can they not see, right? Now, in the meantime, this is all driven by the fact that data commercialization has been recognized out there as a serious um, monetization uh, path. And in fact, uh, you see this with banking, you see this with payments companies, and you see this with um, um, even uh, healthcare, right? Um, the uh, a couple of use cases I borrowed from, from Leap here, here to kind of share with you. Um, if, if you look at um, uh, this, this was an assessment uh, of one of the top payers in the United States where they looked at the risks uh, they have inside the organization, right? How much? Uh, potential liability they could have from that exposure. Uh, it, it, they basically computed that about 40% of the cases, there's serious privacy violations by their own internal team. This is before even sharing, right? 
they managed to actually use the technology to reduce that to 0% of re-identification. And basically, it also ensured that, that this payer was able to include social determinants of health in their analysis because they could actually completely uh, obfuscate uh, things like uh, race, you know, race and, and, and economic uh, level of income, et cetera, uh, because they could potentially use it before and in fact violate the law. So a lot of these things can be made very useful and very safe uh, in this case. Uh, some numbers here around revenue gains uh, uh, and so forth around a, a use case in, in cross-border analytics, uh, where the big issue here was you can't share data across countries. You had to give guarantees uh, around the um, privacy of that data when it's put together. And uh, you need to be able to enable analytics across several silos. And, and that's what, uh, what, what happened in this case, which actually enabled uh, a whole uh, bigger revenue stream to happen and a lot more uh, data to be, to be used with a big savings in, in CapEx and OpEx. The last part of this talk, uh, what I'd like to do is spend maybe five minutes, uh, maybe 10 minutes, walk through very fast, um, kind of our work in uh, an industry initiative called IADS for Initiative for Analytics and Data Science Standards. Uh, my my co-founder of, of this effort is, is Hamid Hamuchu, and, and we fund it kind of a, 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 as, as a sponsor from Open Insights, but really it's meant to, to serve the field. Uh, and this is really about identifying um, who should be called a data scientist, right? And because there's a lot of people call, call themselves data scientists, and we'll, we'll, we'll say why in a second. Um, you know, if you're getting on a plane, you know, would you rather have it be piloted by, by this guy? Uh, Captain Sully, who can react in, in the right moments, or, or, or by these guys who kind of don't know what they're doing. Well, obviously, the, the answer hopefully is very clear. Uh, same if you're, if you're undergoing surgery, you know, you want to make sure that surgeon is qualified and that you're not a, a victim of, of, of some uh, incompetence. Uh, I would ask the same question today. Uh, do you think, especially now that we've gone hyper-digital, especially in, in this new age of, of COVID actually, um, is extracting the right value from, from the data important? And are the people doing analysis on that data qualified to do the analysis appropriately? Can they lead you down the wrong path? Can they have you miss out on big, big opportunities to be competitive, to make money, etc.? I would say it's equally as important as, as the other uh, areas we mentioned. Uh, data science has been kind of getting a lot of uh, 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 airtime and, and hype of its own. Right, so a lot of them talk about it. The, you know, the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data from the Economist. The last door was 2016, 17, 18, and 19. Top job in the United States is data scientists, both from a pay and a lifestyle perspective. Uh, you, and you can go like in 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 many areas and and see uh, and the hype around the field. Uh, a lot of people are working in it. I uh, should probably update this. Uh, uh, chart here, but uh, you know, this is before Kaggle was acquired by Google. Uh, basically, there was a, a, a growth rate of about 120% per annum in the number of people who are doing analytics and, and participating in these uh, competitions on Kaggle, right? And you have no reason to be on Kaggle unless you're doing some serious data science or analytics. So the numbers are big, two and a half million as of 2018. It's much larger now, I'm sure. Uh, there's many groups uh, with uh, uh, growing kind of sizes. Uh, 26 million LinkedIn members with the capability uh, listed uh, relating to data science or, or data analytics. Uh, about 1 million uh, if, if you tar target by title. So you're looking for data scientists or you're looking for data miner and, and things like that, right? So big numbers. There's also a lot of very big groups, surprisingly big groups, 2.6 uh, million member base. Uh, some of these groups are good. I know them. Some of these groups are not so good. Uh, I won't comment on each, but my point is these, these groups have a lot of members uh, in them and they follow the topic. And as you notice, they're really focused on these areas related to analytics. Um, how many data scientists in the world? Um, the co-founder of Kaggle basically says there's between uh, 
1.5 and 3 million. This is about two years ago. Uh, I say to that, really? 100% variance? Uh, this tells you how difficult it is to kind of account for how many there are. Uh, we believe there are uh, 200K to 700K new grads. Again, huge variances to join the job analytics market annually. Uh, the number uh, of jobs uh, for all U.S. data professionals uh, will hit uh, 2.7 million. It was predicted by 2020, and actually we think we're there. And the annual demand uh, for, for these roles, basically the job openings exceeds the people who are available to take those jobs by 700,000 annually, right? And, and that's, and by the way, most people trying to get those jobs are not qualified, as, as we'll discuss in a second. So despite these increasingly large numbers, um, there's still uh, an interest, there's still a, a huge uh, a shortage. Uh, by the way, in 2011, McKinsey forecasted uh, that the US could face a shortage of 150 to 190 K people with deep analytical skills by 2018. Um, and you know, here's an example where McKinsey was right, hats off to them. LinkedIn ran a study in 2018 to try to verify and they got 151 K. So, uh, it was right in the range that uh, that McKinsey predicted uh, uh, seven years earlier. Um, in addition to the shortage, there's there's a, a, a huge variance in these roles, right? So these are data scientists, all working at the same company, Facebook, right? And uh, if we look at uh, what their qualifications are, they come from completely different educational uh, backgrounds. One comes from a business school, another comes from uh, PhD in engineering. Uh, a third one is kind of management and and uh, and language and culture. So you know you look at these candidates and you say, well, you know, how could they hold the same job? And this is the same title in the same company. Um, if you of course look across companies, you see uh, an equally and even wider variance in in these jobs uh, because company you know company A, B, C call it data science, but they mean something completely different uh, for it. Uh, here's an example of job postings, just to give you an idea. And if you read through the qualifications and, and what's required, again, they want a data scientist, completely different. Same for data analysts, by the way, right? So um, th these, these issues actually uh, add to the confounding uh, in this problem. Uh, one of my favorite quotes on a, a job search searcher on Quora talking about the interviews he went through for a data scientist, he basically said, look, you know, they asked me to do pseudocode. Uh, they asked me to do, you know, ask the product specific questions. But his his big comments is is most of these interviews had very little in common. In common, uh, they varied a lot. They went from all day affairs, back to back meetings, program with programmers all day, to just meet with the CTO or CDO and and have a nice discussion about what you like in the future. And uh, uh, <laughs> his comment that I like, ranging from formal interviews with non technical people to what he calls happy hours. Uh, so clearly, basically, companies don't really know how to interview for this role. There's, uh, what about schools? Uh, there's about 250 programs that we tracked uh, up until 2019. We'll probably update the number for 2020. Uh, and, and the growth continues. Uh, uh, this is basically in the US. Uh, but if you look at the programs themselves, you'll see an equal kind of scary variance, right? Uh, the program at Carnegie Mellon and the program at Columbia. And you look at it and you say, hmm. These are not really training the same kind of individual with the same kinds of skills. Uh, BYU versus uh, uh, Winona University, we took those as examples. And again, uh, you know, database intensive and programming intensive, and here much more around visualization and statistics and, uh, and, and so forth. So different kinds of training. Uh, by the way, the same thing for online certificates, whether it's Udacity or Coursera or what have you you get a very different kind of training, very different body of knowledge that, that you're expected to know. So as a result of the skills, uh, skill gap, there's confusion and fast growing, uh, a lot of waste of time, right? Not only are data scientists harder to, to find, right? The data scientists and machine learning are basically double uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the rate to, to find, but their, their uh, retention is, is uh, uh, is worse, right? They churn at higher rates uh, than, say, accountants, as an example. Uh, they take about 45 uh, days to find, so about five days longer than than the average job. Cost about thirty thousand uh, dollars per hire. Uh, the hiring process. Uh, 
is, is about 3,700 costlier per, per data scientist. And we went through some very basic statistics based on the job openings and the candidates and the gaps. Uh, effectively, I computed about wasted time worth of $300 million of, uh, in a year uh, of companies interviewing the wrong candidates for the wrong jo job. And of course, hiring the wrong candidates is even costlier. We, we got numbers in the billions, but um, my conservative estimate is in, in around 600 million. Uh, wasted a year because you, you make the wrong hires because you don't know how to interview, what to hire for, etc. So our goal is to kind of bring a common language between these different communities, the data science, the universities, the academia, the business, the app developers, etc. so that people begin to understand what is this data science about. There is major disagreements, by the way, about what data scientists need, need to, to do. We, we wrote a paper recently in the Harvard Data Science Review. It was published a month ago that basically talks about uh, what, what you need to, to know and, and building a, a body of, of, no, of knowledge. What's agreed about is very minimal and very generic. If you look at, uh, you know, here's my brief history uh, of data science. People have looked you know, at data science as early as you know, 1966, in my opinion. Uh, it was, they didn't call it that, they call it the science of dealing with data. Uh, the, the term was actually formally uh, introduced uh, uh, around 2012, but um, um, it was even proposed at some point to rename statistics uh, data science in, in 1997. ASA itself defines this as a science of learning from data and of measuring, controlling, and communicating uncertainty. That's how they define statistics, right? If, you, if I looked at a statement in terms of the role of statistics in data science, and if you look at it, it kind of misses the mark in my opinion, right? It says basically foundational areas are database management, statistics and machine learning and distributed parallel systems. And I could tell you there's many data science activities that don't have to involve any, uh, maybe one of the three, not all three, uh, sometimes none, right? Um, our definition, and this is a working definition that we came up with in the paper, is using data to achieve specified goals by designing or applying computational methods for inference and prediction. There are several other uh, uh, definitions. I've listed some here. Uh, and you can see uh, a wide uh, variety of what, what people call data science, and we're trying to systematize it. With our definition, we were kind of careful to expand it carefully. What do we mean by each term in it? And I'm sharing these slides so you can look at it or look up the paper uh, that also explains this. Um, We've done some initiatives to make studies around job titles and roles, knowledge and skill requirements, and the assessments and, and metrics. Um, we've done a research study that involved surveys that involved many, many companies. We've been doing community outreach in a lot of uh, meetups, conferences, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have an advisory board uh, that helps us with uh, some of these issues, and these are people both from industry as well as uh, academia. Um, there are two reports that were generated. The first one we published, uh, and the second one is coming up. The second one talks about the survey, uh, the, uh, the, the detailed survey. The, the first one talks about the body uh, of knowledge and the definitions. Um, I'm going to skip some of the stuff, but, but the whole idea here is to kind of at least begin to get agreements and standards as to who uh, is allowed to call themselves a data scientist and uh, to drill down into titles and kind of explain how titles should be described and what you should expect. Uh, look for the next report that will talk about the details of, of this very big survey we did. Uh, uh, and we'll be sharing a lot of these results in the upcoming KDD 2020 uh, workshops. It was supposed to be held in San Diego, but now of course it's gonna be on Zoom uh, in, in about a week's time uh, uh, from, from the date of this conference. Uh, if you're interested, please reach out uh, and get involved and be part of uh, setting these standards. Um, we're looking for people from academia, from industry, from you know, whoever is interested in this, and there are different ways you can help us. Uh, I leave you with uh, my contact information. Uh, thank you for, for listening. I'm going to switch over now to the live portion of, of this session, and hopefully uh, we will have uh, a lot of uh, Q&A from, from all of you. Thank you, and we will uh, switch to the Q&A. 
Yusama, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very enlightening. And as you can imagine, there have been questions that have come up. Uh, so let me kind of start with uh, one that from a friend. I put some of them in the chat box, but uh, we've actually got a question from Tom, Tom Davenport. It says, Yusama, what do you think of efforts by governments like those in South Korea to create large data repositories to encourage the rise of AI and data commerce? Oh, this is it's it's a it's an absolutely great opportunity um, and and a great service that governments can can provide uh, both to help themselves as well as to help grow the research communities and and the uh, ecosystem for for startups and existing companies. So yes, extremely valuable. I mean, the, this whole COVID nineteen situation has actually demonstrated uh, how important it is for us to have the data available. What is the right data? How do we reach data-driven decisions? How do we quickly evaluate what's working, what's not? How do we detect hotspots uh, fast? So this is this is a huge area. I think, uh, I mean, I, I wish the U.S. government was was more proactive, like many other governments around the world, in terms of collecting the data and making it available. Uh, but yeah, huge huge opportunity that I think can hit several birds in one stone, so to speak. Excellent. Uh, another question was, can we get the data fusion definition again? Uh, yes. So I think, uh, by the way, I am sharing the, the, the slides with the audience. So whoever is interested, uh, you, you're more than welcome uh, to, to look at the slides. But uh, the, the quick definition here is the idea is, can you bring data together? from a, a variety of sources across the enterprise and then make them available uh, for use. Now to use it, it's, it's not like humans will sit there and browse, right? What you need is an AI capability that allows you to focus attention on certain events of interest and then collect very quickly, help you decide what happened. And this is an example of kind of uh, the hybrid AI, right? Use AI to sift through tons of data and identify events, i.e. which alarms are worth paying attention to then if you decide you want to investigate, how do I quickly bring the context so that you can look at it quickly and say, make a decision? Now, once you make a decision as a human, that gets captured by the machine and it actually learns to be faster, better next time around and sometimes start making decisions on its own. By the way, what I'm describing here is extremely civil, similar to how Google works, right? Google search engine. That's exactly what uh, ML relevance kind of the way it works. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question came in. We're undergoing a re-architecture of our data. Lots of discussions about approaching our architecture so our data is AI ready. Any suggestions for this? Yes, many, many suggestions. Great question. Uh, so I, I will tell you one thing that is really scary that I see uh, in a lot of companies. When people do the data re-architecture, they are thinking uh, BI, business intelligence. They are thinking about reporting. Uh, here's a piece of news that you need to keep in mind. The kind of data that feeds into reports is aggregate data, typically, right? You want to see a bar chart, you want to see a scatter plot, etc. You want to visualize it in low dimensions for human. It is completely different data set that a machine learning algorithm wants and needs, right? So the machine learning actually needs very granular data at a high level of detail with a lot of attributes or, or variables with it. Exactly the opposite of what a human needs to see, right? So a lot of these data re-architecture efforts end up missing the mark in a big way and not understanding that without having the data ready in the way the algorithms need to be fed, which is very different fundamentally from how humans need to be fed insights and data. Uh, if you don't get it ready, you will never get AI to work, which, which I often say, I, I see this as a pattern, by the way, with, with digital transformation. People forget about the data. They come back and say, oh, now we're blind. We can't see what's happening. What's working? What's not? Why are people leaving? Are we delivering the service we think we're delivering, et cetera? And then they have to retrofit. And effectively, they're building instant technical debt. So this is a very, very important question to kind of answer before you start your transformation on data. I, I think you're muted, Rob, Robert. Yes, I did. I, I muted myself, so that was no background noise. Thank you, Osama. Uh, we've got two more questions. Uh, question number five, 
Uh, we heard about citizen data scientists, that everyone should learn how to use the data. What is the right percentage of professionals data scientists should have in an organization? Ah, well, the, the, first, the first part of the question is, is right on and hits a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I actually call it data citizenship, which is what is the minimum level of knowledge that you, you would expect to have? Actually, ordinary citizens are one level. The next one is in your organization, in your enterprise, how much awareness should be about data and what's available in data? Uh, then, of course, it, it gets deeper and deeper. Like, what should an executive know? What should a board level person know? Now, for data scientists, I have no formula for what percent of, of the workforce they need to be. What we're seeing, though, is there is a huge demand, um, uh, but there's also a huge misuse of the resource. And what, what I mean by that is the following, and this is what you need to keep in mind. You bring in a data scientist, and she is trying to get at some data to solve a problem. And she ends up spending 90% of her time, this is the typical scenario, tracing data, finding data out, why is this broken, what's wrong with it, data quality issues, oh, this doesn't make sense. Because by the way, for the algorithms, garbage in, garbage out. So one, 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 one area of misuse is not having the data ready. The other area of misuse is be very careful about how you use these data scientists because normally you will need them. They're, they're really hot in the first month or two when you investigate and find out some deep insights that give, help you get to actions. But once you get there and you have them on your staff, you know you feel obliged to use them for something, but it's not going to be pure data science. So what happens there is instead of using them for another project in data science, you end up having them, you know, clean the room or you know do something else in, in IT. And, and that's how you, that's a great formula to lose them. So uh, yeah. what I highly advocate is think hard about centralizing the data scientists so that you use them like you use surgeons in a hospital, right? You use them for the job. And then once that's done, transition them to the next set of demand. And right. think very hard about the data engineering support you need to give them so that you're utilizing them correctly. Yes. So we're running over. I'm going to give the last question back to you, which is, could you please provide more information on what Open Insight aspires to do? Okay, so uh, uh, Open Insights is out there effectively to democratize the use of technology and to uh, uh, data technology and to make it possible to implement these big data stacks very quickly, uh, to have a data strategy that ties to the business and drives new revenue streams from the business. So, so what we what historically we started by doing kind of the data strategy work and the valuation of data and new revenue streams. We realized that our clients need a lot of help in kind of building these systems. So we came up with our own formula for how do you bring up this infrastructure super quick and how do you do it iteratively in kind of vertical slices. So you don't take a year to build a, a big data warehouse. You actually do it in 12-week sprints with each 12 weeks delivering value to the business. Uh, by the way, I'm sharing uh, two things I'd like to offer up. I'm sharing the slides, and I'm more than happy to answer any additional questions. So do post them. I will answer them on LinkedIn and, and link them to the conference. Uh, happy to do that and happy to discuss uh, the slides with, with anyone who wants to one-on-one. -on -one. And how would we find you on LinkedIn? Uh, you, you, Fayyad, is the account, uh, and I gave my email, Usama, at openinsights, open-insights.com. So by all means, feel free to email me. Excellent. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, there be there's a lot more to unpack in machine learning, artificial intelligence, as we will see. So hopefully, Usama, we'll have you back at uh, future uh, MIT symposium events. It's been a pleasure having you. Sorry, it's virtual. Uh, we look forward to that. Uh, so for our audience and attendees, it is lunchtime. So we're trying to keep with the consistent schedule that we'd have at MIT Symposium. So this is the time where we ask you to go have a chat with our uh, sponsors, go visit the virtual booth, grab some lunch, and then come back to your specific track. Uh, I'll be monitoring, uh, moderating track B. And uh, uh, Yusama, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of uh, the symposium. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me. Great to be, to be here next year, maybe in person. <laughs> next year in person. Thank you. All right.